I'll do a little bit of talking about um, just kind of my experiences with that and then on to bats and everything else. And, and again, if you have questions, feel free to either queue them up or, or if it's pertinent in the moment, you're going to forget them. Uh, just, uh, just make sure and get those over to Linda and I'll address it right away. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, so been lucky to have been working with bats now for a little over uh, 20 years, and my passions have worked with a lot of different animals uh, over time, but really for the last uh, 15 and a half at BCI, I've been focused on bats, and prior to that, I've had a pretty strong, uh, not just interest, but focus on them. My passions that led me to wild, so my wildlife career, uh, specifically with bats, are really a love of the night and darkness. Um, I grew up down in Tucson, Arizona. In the Sonoran Desert and nighttime uh, for a big chunk of the year is actually a really nice time to be outside. <laughs> and I wasn't a feral child, but I did get outside quite a bit. So uh, I love darkness. I love the nighttime. And then uh, certainly a, a, a really strong love for the flying mammals that we know as bats. So the combination of bats that use underground spaces and then the very habitat that they use, these underground places, caves, mines, all that, is really something that I, I very passionately love. And in the world of wildlife, wildlife conservation, uh, you, you really need that. Um, it can be a tough field. I think a lot of folks pay attention to the news or being in the middle of the Anthropocene and uh, the biodiversity crisis, uh, the, the work. And when we look around, can uh, can get you down if you let it. But uh, the passion uh, that I've got for this work is strong. I let that drive me and, and stay on the optimistic side that we're making a, a big difference out on the landscape. So the work, uh, it can be hard because of the conditions, because of the situations that we know that a particular species of bat might be in, because of partner situations, because of political situations, um, or like this photo illustrates, just physical situations. Uh, it can be uncomfortable. Um, we often find ourselves twisted into all sorts of pretzel positions. To be able to access the the places that we need to get to determine if uh, bats are using it and, and to protect it um, our little furry friends the bats obviously being so much smaller than us can uh, adroitly maneuver through such tiny tight spaces whereas uh <laughs> we uh we have to maintain our our cave yoga so that we can uh, get into these places safely and and comfortably uh, and then inherently hazardous, uh, a lot of the conditions in abandoned mines are exactly that. Inherently hazardous doesn't mean they're immediately dangerous to life and health. Uh, all of us that engage in these particular, uh, this particular style of work have undergone a lot, a lot of training at hazard identification, then also have uh, years or decades, in some cases, of experience of uh, safely working in these places. Um, that being said, you know, head's always on a swivel and we're always making sure that uh, that we're maintaining our safety while we're out there. Uh, and then sometimes uh, it can be slightly frightening too. There's a lot of other animals that use underground spaces other than bats. Uh, some of them happen to be apex predators uh, and that's just something that we have to deal with uh, in situ and, and in the moment. Um, and so far, so good. We just have to maintain calmness. So anyhow, in spite of all of that, I really wouldn't have it any other way. Again, uh, this work represents an intersection of so many things that I'm passionate about and really love. Uh, that it's it's an incredible honor and, and privilege to be working uh, to protect bats in these spaces. So. Uh, and then to date, I've surveyed probably a little over 10,000 abandoned mines over through 3,500 natural caves over, well, I don't know, probably a couple hundred bunkers, crypts, silos, ancient sewer systems, uh, maybe even your grandparents' basement. Um, so I've <laughs> been in a lot, a lot of underground spaces. During that time, I've climbed miles and miles and miles of rope uh, going down to and back out of uh, um, you know, whether it's caves or abandoned mines or other other weird features such as wells. Uh, and then I've been happily working at BCI now for a little over um, 15 and a half years. So the mission of our organization, as some of you may or may not know, is to end bat extinctions worldwide. Um, within Habitat, the Habitat Protection and Restoration Program, you'll hear me refer to that as HPNR. That's the program, not a railroad. Uh, our 
how do we, you know, really dovetail into this um, simple but very profound mission for the organization? Uh, on the subterranean side, uh, so the underground side of things, really it's it's pretty simple. It's identifying, protecting, and conserving abandoned mine roosts, uh, which fit right into this. There are species of bats around the world, as you'll see, that are uh, absolutely dependent upon some of these resources. Uh, and so uh, that's that's the mission posture that we take is that these things are critically important and that that helps, uh, again, the organization then achieve its overall mission of, of ending bat extinctions worldwide. So what does that mean? Uh, it means we focus on specifically habitat management of these underground spaces so that bats like this Mexican long-tongued bat will always have a safe home to give birth to and raise her pup in peace and quiet. Um, and in this photo to help orient you a little bit, uh, you can see her snout pointing down and then under uh, her right wing, you can see she has a, a pup that's tucked up and underneath there. Um, you know, all these caverniculus or underground bat species, uh, almost all of them, uh, you know, give birth to their young and raise their young in the, the protected shelters of, of abandoned mines, caves, uh, other sorts of features. Um, and it's it's really critical that they uh, <laughs> don't have any disturbance while they're in there doing that. Many bat species are used to a level of disturbance from other animals moving in. Um, people disturbance looks and sounds and feels a lot different than uh, than a skunk tootling along the floor, or a raccoon moving in there, or perhaps a ringtail cat, something like that. So. Again, our goal is to really identify sites that are important to bats, uh, work with whoever happens to have jurisdiction of managing or owns the thing and, and getting it protected largely from human intrusion. So. All right, so to that end, over the past 15 and a half years, my team and I have surveyed thousands and thousands of AML features uh, around the world and of all types, shapes, sizes, conditions, flooded, dry, um, halfway in between, humid, you name it. Uh, from sea level to 13,000 feet above sea level, and, and yes, that's a question that we sometimes get in some of the more mountainous parts of the world, which is, you know, how high it's so high for bats to use underground spaces. We've documented using sites right about 13,000 feet uh, in elevation. Uh, for all I know, they could be certainly utilizing habitat higher than that. We just haven't had a chance or an opportunity to uh, to look at mines that are located in e those even higher regions. And then all the way down to sea level, uh, or in some cases below sea, sea level out in, uh, out in Death Valley. And then everything in between. Um, abandoned mines, particularly in the United States, uh, there's thought to be around 500 to 600,000 of them, and they're scattered around. Um, most of uh, the the uh, continental United States, uh, and certainly mines up in Alaska as well. Uranium mines to gold mines, lead, silver, zinc, coal, if they're underground features, uh, those are sites that we will diligently work to get into. Um, bats, as far as we can tell, don't really care what the commodity was that came out of the ground. Um, if it's providing a, a dark place and space underground uh, that has consistent humidity or uh, maybe other microhabitat features they're looking for, bats will, uh, will quickly move in and, and start using the site. They seem to be really, really, really good at um, keeping a handle on available underground real estate within, within their home range. Um, uh, sites that have been opened up, uh, that have been closed for a while, meaning that maybe they had a backfill of dirt being pushed into them uh, that are opened up. We've seen recolonization by bats uh, inside of a week. Um, so they can they they certainly seem to know what's what's out there. Um, and then all conditions. Um, Sometimes we've got to get out in the winter time to do hibernacula surveys at sites, uh, or sometimes that's just when the work has to happen. Um, so uh, much like the uh, postal service of your rain, sleet, snow, hail, um, we'll get out there and, and do the assessment of these sites uh, so that we can get them protected so that bats can continue using them. So 
All right, with that, um, how about the bats? So the unfailing conclusion and weight of the evidence that we have, uh, we, and I'm saying royal we, meaning in the uh, the larger bat community and natural resource community of, of how, how and why bats utilize underground um, mines, uh, shows us that bats around the globe uh, don't just like mines, they absolutely need them. Um, so this mother and pup are roosting in a decommissioned copper mine in Southern Arizona. And you'll hear me using uh, some different terminology, abandoned versus decommissioned versus orphaned. So decommissioned in this sense is a, a site that is still owned by uh, a mining company uh, and they have, have closed it down. So uh, gone through the, the shutdown process of removing uh, equipment and, and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's by no means abandoned. They still maintain ownership and management of the site. Um, so just using that, I understand that's a, a subtlety, but something that uh, sometimes different folks are sensitive to out there. So uh, when they went about decommissioning this particular site, though, often industry does that in a manner of uh, they're looking at the lifespan of a, of a mine from cradle to grave, so to speak. And, and once it's decommissioned, it goes into something called care and maintenance. And a lot of times wildlife aren't really accounted for. Um, this particular mine had uh, over 2,000 miles of underground workings in it. So um, a lot, a lot of available space for bats to potentially move in and uh, and colonize. Uh, this area, unfortunately, access to the underground workings was was like destructively closed off to bats. They couldn't access it um, other than this one large stope where these bats were found. A stope being a large void underground instead of what you might think of as a, a straight working or something, a curving drift or something like that. So these bats uh, were using what was available and roosting in that stope along with several owls that were also roosting in there. Uh, we tend to think of that as not necessarily the best situation for bats since owls eat bats on a pretty regular basis, uh, but just showing how um, one of the things we work with different agencies and companies on is to ensure that when things are either decommissioned or closed off, it's done in a manner that's going to benefit um, bats. Uh, certainly lots of other wildlife too, but really focused in on bats. And there would have been some simple, easy things they could have done at this site to ensure that the bats could um, utilize other spaces that would have been owl free. So. All right, um, and speaking of bats really, really needing uh, mine sites. So in Guinea, Africa, these Lamotte bats uh, shown here, this is a still taken from uh, camera footage on a remotely operated vehicle that we uh, deployed into that site are, are roosting with their young. The landscape outside of this uh, is heavily, heavily impacted by anthropogenic activities. There's a lot of landscape burning going on. Uh, people kind of scouring the landscape for um, for protein and various resources. Uh, so these bats uh, can't safely roost in natural caves outside of this area anymore um, without uh, risk of very high levels of, of disturbance. And so they have now found themselves collapsed down into uh, a series of these prospect adits that are driven into a mountain. Uh, for the purpose of looking at a, an iron deposit there. And, and that's it. Um, this is a critically endangered bat that is on the very, very brink of extinction. And so clearly uh, these mines are of exceptional importance. And when we look at bats globally, um, so not just critically endangered bats like Lamotte's uh, or the previously endangered uh, bat, the lesser long-nosed bat in the previous slide, our previous couple slides, um, you know, bats have in some cases expanded their ranges because abandoned mines are found in areas where there are not natural caves that allows them to, to utilize habitat in those places. Um, but there's a lot of pressure on, on their natural roost environments in, in terms of natural caves for all sorts of different reasons. Um, bats might need to move into abandoned mine areas because of, uh, pressures on the landscape, like wind energy that pose a lethal threat to them. Uh, perhaps a cave site uh, has had something happen on the surface that blocks it out. You know, a tree falls in front of the, the entrance or 
maybe flooding causes changes uh, uh, to clog up an entrance that they were using. Um, you know, there's the threat of white nose to them and in certainly any underground space. So bats have now, <clears throat> what we've seen, really just begun to use um, abandoned mines just holistically. It's underground roosting space. If we took that away from many bat species at this point, I think we would see a lot of bats uh, tipping very much into the, the point of, of trouble. So these things really do represent a, a critical resource at this point. All right, elsewhere on the globe, this bat, the Peruvian long-snouted bat, is facing similar challenges in the Atacama Desert, where it's uh, an endemic uh, around Arequipa, Peru. Um, this might look a site that might look familiar to some of you. This is a, an open pit copper mine uh, that's in the region. Uh, it's currently a, a producing mine and uh, and is is going to be uh, expanding in the direction of the uh, the copper deposit out there. Uh, so in a landscape with few natural roost options, uh, to begin with, human actions have really driven these bats to use what they can find, which which here again happen to be, um, abandoned mines that are kind of uh, very lightly scattered throughout this landscape. Um, this particular mine represents uh, one of the largest known roosts for this particular uh, species of bat. Um, and we we don't really know how many bats are, are in this particular one due to the challenges of, of finding other entrances to this and some safety considerations and all that. Um, so that's... Uh, Yet another one of the challenges that we face is, um, so if bats are on this landscape and have been for a long time, and then their natural roost resources are impacted or having to move for whatever reason, um, and then bats move into abandoned mines, what happens when the abandoned mines are threatened uh, by expansion of, of resource extraction activities on the landscape? So one of the options we look at is creating other other mines, driving a, an underground space for the purpose of bats. That's uh, in many cases prohibitively expensive. Uh, I would bet it's probably about ten thousand dollars for every three feet of underground uh, workings driven in a standard, probably three and a half foot by six foot high side of things. So it's it's not as simple as putting out a bat box or putting out something like a birdhouse or for some of the birds that have lost their cavity dwelling uh, options uh, on the landscape. So um, that's something that we're actively puzzling out. Uh, there's There are other options out there and it's it's one of the reasons we work with um, industry or, or whoever else happens to have these things so that we have a chance to ensure that bats are, are adequately being represented and, and cared for when, uh, when roost options are gonna be disappearing for them. All right, so here's a juvenile California leaf nose bat in an abandoned gold mine in southern Arizona. So again, bats utilize these things at all their various stages of life. There are other species that are forest bats in the summertime and in the winter will kind of collapse down uh, into a few underground sites for uh, hibernating. So bats will use them in, in that manner too. And then some species uh, use them uh, simply for feeding, uh, a safe place to get out of the landscape to be able to consume that big beetle that they just got. Uh, species like the pallid bat uh, is one of those that they're really pretty flexible with their use of underground sites. They definitely roost underground, they're in caves, they're in mines. Um, a lot of times they're in other things uh, out there on the landscape too, houses or uh, uh, vegetation or crevices and cracks and cliff sides and all that sort of stuff. Um, and they'll simply fly into an abandoned mine after they've captured a, a bug, hang up and, and pull it apart and eat it. Um, as I had previously mentioned, um, in a lot of places, the the only really aerial predators of, of bats at night happen to be owls, but there, there are certainly other critters moving around on the landscape that will opportunistically take bats. So. They have developed that strategy uh, as a as a safety safety mechanism as well. So. All right, here's a couple of uh, couple Townsend's big eared bats that are uh, day roosting uh, on the left, and then one that's hibernating over on the right and snoozing away. Um, I like this because it just shows the pelage variation that we sometimes see with these bats. The one on the left being a more uh, typical 
but still striking Townsend's Vigard and the one on the right being uh, what I would consider almost to be a cold block Townsend's Vigard bat, which is uh, always fascinating to see and, and not something that we really see all that um, commonly. But we do see pelage variation uh, pretty regularly in, in a lot of the species. All right, so we know bats need sites with limited disturbance. And again, when I say that, the disturbance is really centered around uh, limiting human disturbance, um, but it can also mean uh, limiting the disturbance or places that are free from predation. Um, there's, again, a, a bunch of different animals out there that just naturally uh, feed on bats, certainly rattlesnakes being one of those, but many other species of, of snakes. And then I'd say over the last uh, 10 years, there's been a, a relative explosion, I guess you could say, of folks that are now recreationally exploring underground mines. And this is one of the more prominent groups that's that's out there that's really put a huge focus on um, on the uh, the cool factor of going into abandoned mines and all that. There, you know, understandably, there's a lot of folks that are interested in the mining history uh of of whatever region they happen to be in and, and we're not saying there's anything wrong with that um a lot of the abandoned mine land programs for the natural resource agencies uh actively discourage or in some cases very much prohibit uh jurisdictionally uh access to underground workings because of the inherent hazard um uh, I'd say within the last year, there's been uh, some things that have made it out into the national media about some particular artifacts found underground of very, very high value. Um, and I'm sure that has probably spiked things as well. And when we think about um, human disturbance at underground mine sites that happen to be bat roosts, really what that comes down to is, and this you know, obviously includes us, the ones that are in there to try and help bats, the, the noise disturbance of simply moving through um, and uh, our, our own noise discipline is quite good. We tend to just only talk when we need to do that in a low voice. Otherwise, don't talk as we're moving through the workings. Uh, so you've got that. Um, you've got the air disturbance as you're moving through small spaces like that. You're, you're moving the air column uh, and that seems to have some level of a tactile disturbance to bats. They are covered in fur. Bats do have, uh, many of them have, have whiskers up around their um, around their rostrum, their snout. Uh, and so air movement could potentially be disturbing them. And of course there's light. None of us ha have cat vision. <laughs> uh, so we're typically running several sources or one source of very bright lights. Um, and that definitely uh, disturbs bats. So for a casual explorer who isn't uh, really keyed in on how to minimize disturbance to bats, uh, they they really can cause quite a, a quite an episode for bats that might be day roosting. They're causing them to flush and fly out of the site. Uh, if they have young with them, they could potentially drop their young as they're fleeing the the perceived danger of people being in there. Um, again, our own posture when we're in there is we tend to either um, turn our, he our head, meaning our, our lights away from bats when we see them roosting, uh, turn the volume of the light down so it's very dim. Uh, we don't handle the bats when we're underground to, to reduce that disturbance. Um, and then another key difference, we've seen a lot of people are actually that are exploring these underground sites are actually um, scared of bats. And so I have that kind of posture too, where they just don't know what to do, whereas we're in there to... Uh, minimize disturbance while trying to figure out if it's a site that needs to be uh, protected. So anyhow, to that end, a lot of the, the management that we do is, is centered around trying to keep uh, essentially humans out of, of bat roosts. Uh, so that the bats can do this, um, live their life in, in peace and quiet. And one of our, the main tools in our toolbox uh, for doing this are uh, bat gates. And so they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. They tend to be made out of uh, steel. Sometimes they're angle iron, sometimes they're square tubing, sometimes they're round bars. Uh, it just depends. You'll notice this looks like, I, I know there's no scale here. This is a relatively small gate uh, and you can see that the rock around the portal is relatively fractured and pretty weathered. That's, that's super common um, for the entrances or portals as we call them of abandoned mines. Um, so 
uh, the gating contractors, instead of digging those things out and trying to knock all that stuff down, build them in situ, that also serves a, a nice twofold purpose of uh, continuing to support the integrity of that portal so that it stays open, um, so that bats can continue to, to use that through, uh, through the years, hopefully decades and longer. All right, so a quick snapshot of what this looks like. A lot of times we're using aerial support. Uh, these mines are found all over the place, and a lot of times they're in relatively remote spaces. Uh, you've got hundreds and hundreds of pounds of, of gear and material to put a steel gate in place. So sling loading them in on a helicopter is often actually a very cost efficient and, and safe method to do that. Here you can see the crew unloading uh, off of the, the sling, that generator sitting on the, the sled that it was brought in on. Um, and you'll notice too, there's snow on the ground. One thing we, again, following on that theme of uh, <clears throat> keeping the disturbance as low as possible is once a crew has gone out and determined the, bat, the usage of the site, it's summertime usage, uh, then we'll do the prescription of putting a gate in place during the winter when we know bats might not be using it. So we always try and do the gating timed around when bats are not going to be uh, using the site to try and keep disturbance as low as possible. There are times when uh, a gate might need to go in place and there are bats that are actively using the site. Uh, the contractors in this case will be uh, notified uh, and their standard operating procedures, they do not go far back into the workings anyways. And they tend to try and keep things as quiet as they potentially can anyhow. So it, it uh, you know, the installation of a gate on a, a roost like that tends to be a very short term uh, disturbance uh, in one very specific area, which is right at the entrance. Most bats are found or tend to be found further back into the workings, 50 feet or more. So, um, you know, we try to avoid that, but sometimes it, it simply can't be avoided. All right, the helicopter moving on out of the canyon efforts dropped everything off and is uh, ski daddling out of there until it needs to come back to pick up things. And then here's what, what the gating looks like um, kind of from the inside there. So you can see the the gate builder has a level on there. Try and keep the bars relatively level so that um, bats have a can build up a predictable flight path to, to move through these things. Um, again, bat gates are great. They're designed to keep people out and allow bats to keep moving back and forth. Um, we fully understand that these are not ideal from a bat's perspective. Uh, they've been used uh, certainly in the United States for, I think, well over 40 years now. And there's been some pretty subtle design tweaks depending on species or uh, conditions of where you're working in. But, the, you know, generally there there's a, a pretty standard shape and form to them. Uh, so th that, you know, most bats use. All right, and then here, another shot of them uh, connecting it essentially to the, the rib. So there's a mine, so the sides of a mine are called the rib. The top part, uh, as we might think of it, the ceiling is called the back. Uh, these gates tend to be pinned and welded to the rock uh, so that people can't just pull them out. A lot of different attack methods on gates. People do want to get underground, and, and sadly, if they want to, they'll almost certainly be able to find a way to do that. Uh, but for the most part, these things are about as solid as, as we can get them uh, without it being cost prohibitive uh, and keeping most, most people out. All right, not the same gate, but just an example of a, just a square tube gate that's been put over a, a mine, and you can just generally see what that looks like. So a finished gate. Uh, again, all with the end goal so that uh, bats like this myotis have a safe place to roost. Um, and as we previously mentioned, they, they love these sites. So that's what we do. All right. So what makes mines such a, uh, great places for bats to be able to roost? Uh, here you can see this is, um, this is a site out in uh, uh, Death Valley National Park. Very arid landscape. Gets very hot out there. Uh, so bats are really after stable temperatures uh, and underground spaces uh, offer that. So they, the, those stable temperatures will help bats easily thermoregulate thermo when temperatures on the surface are highly variable and weather dependent. So in the summer, colonial roosting species like Townsend's bigger bats can find many suitable spaces within mines. Uh, if it's a cluster like this where um, maybe it's a maternity colony and they're looking for higher temperatures, 
Uh, many times, large mines that are multi-level will offer many, many different warm or hot spots or cool spots so they can move around underground to find the right kind of conditions that they need uh, for whatever their particular, uh, whatever time of year it is. Um, or, uh, you know, this could be a cluster of bats that are likewise hibernating. Townsends tend to hibernate with their ears curled up, but uh, we, as temperatures sometimes fluctuate underground even slightly, uh, bat, these bats will thermoregulate using their ears, so they'll slightly uncurl them or move them out uh, just to, to cool off even more. So. All right, and then um, again, in the wintertime, uh, cool, constant temperatures underground uh, really can help bats hibernate. And that's what they're looking for. So they'll, uh, this, this particular one being a, typically a forest bat um, in most of its range, this is an Allen's lappet browed bat. But again, in arid landscapes uh, where there might be a lack of snags or other places for them to roost, they'll, uh, they'll go underground to find a, a stable climate to be able to, uh, to zonk out for the wintertime, whatever that happens to, to mean <laughs> in some parts of the, the country. <laughs> And then uh, no matter the time of year, what bats are looking for, the underground workings of mines offer something in stark contrast to the surface. So here, uh, a nice chunk of Sonoran Desert, um, you know, in the wintertime, sure, it can be kind of cool out there, but still relatively warm and almost always pretty, um, pretty dry. So the underground spaces offer darkness and humidity. Um, so because bats have a large surface area to uh, bare skin. So think about like looking at our, our little um, cave myotis friend here. We've got that little puff of fur that represents its body and then these um, relatively large big wings and then the tail membrane that you can see there just below its, uh, uh, its body. Those for the most part just don't have any fur on them. So uh, because of this, bats uh, can desiccate very quickly and easily. I mean, these are highly uh, vascularized uh, parts of their body. There's all these blood vessels that move through them. So uh, especially for desert bats or even bats living in any, any environment for that matter, they can, they can really dehydrate very quickly. So going underground into places that have high humidity negate that fact when they're hanging there roosting for uh, five, six, seven, eight, 12 hours uh, a day or um, when they're hibernating for sometimes months on end. So uh, the stable microclimates offered in a mine are necessary for many, many species of bats to be able to survive on the landscape. And, uh, and bats always seem to be able to find a place to hang out in, in these mines. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different microclimate and microhabitat options. Uh, many mines have all sorts of pieces of derelict infrastructure that are left in them. In this case, a wire that's just hanging down out of the back that probably held up a piece of ventilation pipe or something like that. And it's not uncommon to see bats hanging on, on things like that. Um, Townsends are, are one of the most commonly observed bats that we find underground. And they also seem to be really, really flexible. I've seen Townsends in uh, drifts underground in mines where we recorded um, <laughs> Air, the air moving at, at speeds over 20 miles an hour and their fur literally like blowing in the breeze. And yet there was a whole bunch of Townsends hanging out in that drift. And why, I, I do not know they were why they were after that type of climate. Many times we see them in still cool areas and plenty of other times they're out hanging pendant like this, just hanging out there. And, and whether a mine seems like it's still or not, there is always some level of air exchange that's that's moving through those things. So. All right, and then sometimes there's plenty of other animals that find refuge and shelter in these two. This is a check walla that was hanging out at the entrance of a, a particular mine in a desert area, obviously, but lots of other animals benefit from these sites being protected as well. So if you're a reptile lover, then uh, know we're doing good for them too. All right, and at the end of the day, what we've really arrived at is that mines should always, by default, be considered to be bat roosts. Um, it's it's just 
the the usage that we see globally and certainly here in the United States, really, we couldn't say anything other than that. There is always a relatively high likelihood that bats are using uh, an abandoned mine at least some part of the year, um, whether it's for a day or two as they're migrating or just as a night roost to be able to eat insects or anything like that. So to that end, internal surveys are really the gold standard for determining habitat suitability and bat use. Um, an acoustic detector or device cannot tell you that you have a, a, a little canyon bat roosting in a drill hole in a mine. It can't uh, determine uh, that there's guano piles in there or show you the insect parts. And in many cases, the very prohibitions that are keeping people out of mines, meaning wildlife biologists or agency folks that are driving them to potentially use acoustics also mean they can't even go underground to put acoustics slightly in further inside of a, a, a working. So while acoustics do have a good place and a good role to play in, in bat management uh, you know, in the world, really not an effective tool for determining uh, bat use underground. Uh, again, the biggest reason is because an acoustic device can't tell you anything about the internal habitat uh, suitability of a particular site um, uh, or the microclimate options that are that are offered in there. ROVs are something that that I talked about previously. Those things can be used, but still just not as good as getting a, a qualified team of folks underground. And by team, we tend to mean uh, two different two different folks, a uh, a safety lead who's up in the front keeping an eye out for um, hazards and the person behind who's really charged with doing the biological assessment of the site. So at this point, we simply cannot afford to let these highly valuable resources continue to be treated like lepers uh, of an industrial past. Um, mines are at this point an indispensable roosting resource for bats here in North America and globally. And that's the, the posture that we take when we're dealing with folks that are uh, managing them or trying to figure out what to do with them if, uh, if they don't already know. So there we go. All right. Thank you for your time and attention. And I think we can pop over to doing questions. I think I'm pretty good on time here if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jason. Uh, yeah. So we're going to do questions now. Um, I do apologize that the chat setting was not changed. So sorry that you couldn't um, uh, to the audience that you can chat, but we've got plenty of questions in the Q&A box. Um, so let's pop over there now and see what we've got. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh, yeah. Some good folks in here. All right. And well, I see Tony Gallegos is on here, Gallegos. So, hey, Tony. Good to see him. Uh, I can start at the top. You want me to just go through this, Linda, or do you want to read those out? Or, um... yeah, uh, but I didn't want to say um, if, if you want to pop your video back on, um, Jason. That's sure. Great. Yep. There we go. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. So, um, from Douglas to begin with, um, our you or BCI still working with the California Department of Conservation Abandoned Mine Land Unit? Yes, we certainly are. Yep. Cool. Any any recent projects, or is that kind of just an ongoing thing? Uh, it's it's an ongoing thing. We've had a a working relationship with them since two thousand, back prior to two thousand and eight. Um, so for for quite a few years now. Yeah, they're a, a really good group of folks. Ooh. All right. Um, so doo -doo -doo. Um, are there any differences in population health dependent on the type of mine? For example, lead slash uranium versus gold. And this question is from Casey. Sure. Uh, not that we've been able to see. Back in 2010, 11, 12, we um, actually did a, a research project trying to figure out if bats were harmed by roosting in abandoned uranium mines, uh, kind of in the Four Corners region. And we, you know, there's always constraints on funding amounts that then directly correlate to how long you can run a project, but we didn't see any, um, any particular correlation, um, uh, either directly or through extrapolation of bats uh, having any ill effects. 
Um, most uranium mines, one thing that's uh, interesting about them versus something like a gold or a copper, mine, a metallic mine, is that you know when when miners were in those sites developing them, they had the tools available to like literally find where the ore was. Um, so meaning a scintillometer or a Geiger counter, um, and so they did a very effective job at removing most of the really re radioactive material in there. Many, many sites we've been into have very, very low levels of gamma radiation, which that would be a result of having things like uraninite and the other um, radioactive ores that are in there. The thing that we find more of is uh, is radon, which is naturally off-gassing out of the, the material that's in there. So we really focused on looking at that, uh, radon being an inhalation hazard, or rather uh, the progeny of radon, which is um, uh, materials that uh, occur through the breakdown um, of of the radon through time end up uh, so radon is really interesting that it goes from a, a gas to a solid as part of its de decay chain um, those particles can be ionizing radiation that you can inhale so that's often where radon is associated with uh, lung cancers and we thought well hey maybe that's the same for bats if they're roosting underground they'll be exposed to that. Radon happens to be heavier than air and so settles low in an abandoned mine. So if you don't have uh, a lot of disturbance moving in there, bats actually um, nine times out of 10 are, are roosting up and above the layer of radon, which tends to settle very low. There's obviously exceptions to that and all that, but anyhow, all that to say that, no, we've not observed uh, any differences in colony health between, uh, between commodity types that were being pulled out of mines. So. Fascinating. Um, uh, a question from George. Uh, have you ever been asked to survey lands proposed for flooding by a new dam, um, whether caves, mines, wells, et cetera, have bat roosts? Man, that is a really specific and a good question, George. Uh, nope, not yet, but maybe you'll be the first. Um, another Another question from George, um, since some future mining is inev inevitable, what types of mines could become useful to bats after decommissioning? Presumably not open pit or strip mines. That's a great question, George. One thing that we've looked at for a while is, uh, so all mines, whether they're underground, open pit, strip mines are producing a large uh, ratio of waste material versus um, you know commodity, the mineralized stuff that they're after. And so mining companies and, and bat folks have looked at like trying to bury uh, concrete culverts or the big tires that come off of their haul trucks to as a waste pile is built up that those spaces are built on top of it, covered over, and you're creating underground stuff. Um, tires, eh, that's not really worked out so well. And there's obviously potential for some like future contamination from those things being buried in a pile of, uh, of rock. But I think there's still a lot of potential for um, concrete cul culvert type structures to be um, emplaced within waste rock piles where they will be thermally stable and, and, uh, and offer a place for bats to roost. So, um, you know, that's something we're always uh, looking at. Industry is uh, a hard nut to crack. We, you know, BCI is, uh, I'd say we're um, pretty middle of the road organization. You know, we're not coming in there telling people like you can't be, can't or shouldn't be mining. It's like mining is mining. It's, it's, it's a thing like you mentioned. Um, so we're trying to look at, okay, what are the positive ways that we can work with, work with these companies to try and either create new habitat through their activities or, salvage or protect other things that are out there. And that's that's something we're just constantly talking with mining companies on, so. Um, a kind of a, a follow-up, like, is there like a checklist of key bat-friendly measures that mining companies and regulators can use in mine design and decommissioning plans? And do they seem receptive to using something like that? Uh, so that's been brought up with a few different mining companies. Uh, and it's really about getting into the right time on the design of these things because a lot of mines are designed on a 20 year 30 year time frame you know if we're not at the table a lot of times they'll just be like well you know we've already passed this thing and it's been signed off by corporate and we're not in there but the, the answer is yes i mean i'm particularly interested in underground mines many of the active ones that get decommissioned there's like zero um 
uh, accommodation, realizing that, you know, they just spent 30 years mining this thing and there's hundreds of miles of workings. And for the simple cost of uh, maybe 6,000 bucks to put a gate over it, they, they now can flip its use from a, a commodity producing underground mine to a, a large world-class resort for Lord knows how many species of bats in that region. So that's something that we're definitely interested in. And it's, again, uh, industry has been uh, a really hard nut to crack. If there's any industry folks on here, I mean, um, we'd love to, to work with you. Uh, I think there's uh, maybe a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction for industry uh, either wanting or truly desiring to partner with a conservation organization for all sorts of different reasons. It's it's complex, but uh, I can certainly assure you we're, uh, we're a, a really good partner to work with. So, um, so a question from Craig: uh, Does BCI work to transfer old mines to con conservation preserves? Yeah, that's a, a really good question, and the answer is yes. We have a, a partner organization called the Underground Conservancy. That's a, a another five hundred one c three nonprofit that uh, when uh, sites become available, we can discuss with that organization to see if that's something they want to take on. They uh, serve as a as a land trust essentially and house a few different abandoned mines and natural caves around the country. So yeah, that's that's something that we definitely uh, always try and and help with if we can. Question from Douglas: uh, Has it been shown that culvert closure affects bats' use of the mine? Mm, good question, Douglas. So really, I think the answer between so we know bats use. Uh, mines that have had a culvert placed in the entrance to stabilize it. So we know that for sure. Like there's a lot of documentation. I think the real problem with culverts comes down to the diameter. Um, we've seen a lot of two foot diameter culverts placed out into the into mines in the landscape. And that's just simply, it's too small. Um, the advice we give to our, our partners when we're working with them and culverts need to be used is, um, uh, the example is, is like it's traffic control, right? So if you have a, an intersection in your neighborhood and suddenly, uh, uh, you know, uh, the city decides to constrict it down, that's going to significantly slow things down. So it's the same deal with bats. When we put a standard bat gate over an added entrance, bats necessarily have to slow down a little bit as they fly through it. And if you have a big colony of bats, that creates, um, you know, a bottleneck. That bottleneck then can invite uh, predators to have an easier opportunity for being able to, to prey on these bats. Small diameter culverts, same deal. Like bats, why would a bat want to fly, you know, six inches off the ground when there's snakes, lizards, bullfrogs, skunks, ringtail cats, any, any, number of predators that could reasonably hope to to just snag a flying bat when it's coming in really low like that. So I know there's been a lot of discussions in the bat world about culverts and this and that and their reflectivity of of uh <laughs> the reflection of their of their acoustics while they're flying in it and all that. And and really like I'd say a lot of that's probably no pun intended noise. Uh, it just comes down to the fact that many culverts constrict an entrance simply too small for bats to be able to want to go through it or to be able to safely go through it. So uh, prescription is always the largest culvert that you can fit into that site um, and and really don't use anything less than three feet in diameter. And even three feet is uh, sometimes questionable. So. Okay. Um, a question from Tom, is the Endangered Species Act effective in protecting bats in caves? Hmm, it's <laughs> a good question. Uh, yes. Um, so a lot of caves, if they're on federally managed land here in the United States, are protected by the Federal Cave Management Protection Act. So that's a handy tool we have. Uh, if an endangered species is found underground, whatever that happens to be a cave, a mine or whatever else, then yes, um, that that is a, a really, really valuable tool in, in protecting that type of habitat. So um, that being said, there's holes in everything. There's loopholes uh, designed on purpose and loopholes not designed on purpose and all sorts of interpretations. So 
Uh, your mileage will vary on that, um, but for the most part, I'd say uh, yes, ESA helps with that. Um, and then sometimes there are other things built into the protection of a species that can result in you scratching your head and going, I thought that was a protected bat. And like, well, no, they're allowed, you know, industry is allowed take or whatever it happens to be on, on that particular species. So, yeah. Okay. Um, a question from Casey. Are there different management regulations slash recommendations depending on when or how often bats are using the mines, um, you know, roost versus hibernation versus migration. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that's, uh, that's whole, a part and parcel of what we do when we, when we get underground and make the note of, okay, this site is being used as uh, a hibernacula for this particular season, or it has multi-season use where we see insect parts and everything else. Um, uh, you know, that that are clearly showing us that bats are using it during the, the we, we say warm season. Um, sometimes we'll see evidence of typically larger guano piles above the guano pile, roost staining. Um, and then sometimes in conjunction with that roost staining, there might be some insect evidence that can really point us to the fact that a maternity colony is using it during the summer. So recommendations are keyed to the bat use period. Um, meaning if it's a winter site, you, how to handle that and manage it moving forward will be premised and based on that. So that's really like the key reason why we we fight really hard to be able to get underground and, and line out what the particular use of the site is, as well as the options that are in there. There's, there's no other real effective way to do it. So, yeah. and that extends to the timing of the gating, sometimes the types of gate that are in there were pretty limited on on overall like bar spacing and everything else on gates simply because again, the the purpose of them is to keep people out. I mean, the ideal for bats is that there would be no gate uh, on a on a mine or a cave, right? It would just be open. And a lot of times that's just that's just not tenable for the the land manager that's out there. So, um, you know, the gates do uh, do represent a compromise, but a, I would argue a, a very good compromise so that we don't have conflict with the AML programs that are out there. You know, we get to work side by side with them. They get their mission of, of uh, closing these things off for people achieved, and we're able to achieve our mission of, of uh, identifying and protecting uh, critical roost space. So. Sorry. Okay, I'm back. Sorry. Um, I'm going to try and squeeze in two more questions. Um, so from Wayne, uh, what cues do bats use to know when the sun is setting and it's time to emerge and hunt from the mine? Sure. Uh, it could be, I, I think, several different cues. Um, many bats are roosting uh, somewhat close to the twilight zone, and so they're able to actually see the light changing uh, underground. Uh, as the day, you know, the sun does its thing and, and starts to set. Um, there's likely subtle temperature cues as well, because I mentioned there's really subtle air movement in these sites. Uh, I would think maybe um, potentially a sense of smell as well, because, um, you know, the landscape uh, smells different as it's heating or cooling down, especially in different areas. Uh, so I think it's, it's largely um, visual. And a lot of times what we see is bats will, um, I don't know what else to put it. It's like you, you get bats that will come out and kind of check things out. So before emergence, sometimes even up to an hour before a lone bat will kind of come flittering on out and then go back in. Um, and so it seems like they're sending, a, I'll just say like a scout to check things out and see what things look like. Is it raining? Um, you know, is the entrance clear? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, but it definitely seems like they're doing a, an evening recon before they commit to a full emergence of, of the sites. And we see that at large colonies like the uh, free-tailed sites where maybe it's a cluster of them that come out and then go back in to uh, to smaller colonies of just 10 or five or 15 bats where, where one or two will just kind of flitter out and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then poof, they'll, they'll head on out. So. It's bat reconnaissance. Yep. 
All right, so uh, one last question. Um, how can non-bat experts help get the word out about the importance of mines to bat populations? Yeah, good question. I think there's a lot of ways out there. Uh, maybe your own TikTok channel about how mines are great for bats. Uh, I'm not sure. There's, there's. We tend to take the approach of talking to agency partners and the people that are managing them. Um, for the the general public, I'd say it's keeping your keeping your eye out if you have a connection to your state wildlife agency. Um, just always advocating that, like, hey, I know there's mines out here and there's a closure program in the state. Are bats being accounted for? For the most part in the United States, I'd say the answer is yes. Um, there's still a ways to go, though, especially with some of the state agencies um, and especially with coal mines in the in the coal regions of the United States. Uh, you know, again, we understand there's a whole lot of different considerations behind why mines are being closed uh, and that bats are just one of the, the many considerations or wildlife for that matter. Uh, so it's really just continuing to be an advocate within either your communities or or just talking to people and spreading the word that can uh, you never really know how what kind of effect that can have. So. Uh, okay, so thanks again, Jason, for educating us about the work BCI is doing to protect barrows and mines. Um, thank you as well to the audience for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about habitat protection and restoration work, visit our website at batcon.org. That's B-A-T-C-O-N.org. And if you haven't already, subscribe to our mailing list and newsletter. That's where you'll hear about future webinars and the work that we do. Um, this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel um, uh, sometime next week. Just search at Bat Conservation on YouTube. Uh, any final words, Jason? No, just thank you so much for coming and listening. And uh, hopefully you found this enjoyable and, and uh, learned something. Uh, and thank you so much for supporting our work. And, uh, you know, if there's anyone out there that's certainly interested in working with us or partnering or just asking questions, you, you know where to find us where Linda just mentioned. So thank you so much for your support. And we really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so that's all for now. I hope everybody loves bats even more than you did an hour ago. And we'll see you at the next bat chat. All right, thanks everyone. Bye.